Atau good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, well, my name is Darren, and I'm, res- uh, I'm responsible for the uh, recruitment of uh, MA students uh, to study at ISS. Uh, so thank you so much for taking your time off from your busy schedule to come for this, uh, to attend for this uh, Mundus Map uh, webinar session. Um, now, without further ado, I will pass on the floor to the course leader of this uh, Mundus Map program, uh, Karim Knio. Karim. Thank you, Darren. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Karim Knio. I'm an associate professor in international political economy and governance uh, at Erasmus University, uh, Rotterdam. Um, and I actually, I've, I've, I'm the representative of the program in the academic consortium uh, board as well. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce everyone on board today. Natasha. Thank you, Karim. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Natasha. Um, I'm from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I am part of the cohort uh, for ISS York track on governance and development. And um, on to you, Fabi. Yeah, um, um, my name is Fabiola. I'm from Mexico City and I'm right now doing the track from Barcel- uh, ISS in Barcelona. Hi, my name is Alonso. I'm from Costa Rica. And the same as Fabiola, I'm enrolled in the ISS IB track on um, political economy and development. Yeah, so thank you so much for the introduction. Um, now, Karim, can you already begin your presentation on the uh, Mundus Map Group? Okay, thanks a lot. Um, basically, uh, as you may all know, the uh, one of the ma- major messages of the of this consortium on Erasmus Mundus uh, main public policy is to actually provide different kind of trainings and understanding of public policy, and that can be easily seen in the variety of tracks that we provide. Of course, today I would like to talk about the ISS tracks, so namely. The one with eBay, with Barcelona, which is basically centering around political economy and development, and uh, the one with uh, York, which is basically centering on governance and development as well. Um, uh, apart from these different kind of understandings of public policy that are that you that you could see in these tracks, uh, an important perhaps distinction that we make in our consortium is the differentiation between problem solving and problem situating approaches to public policy. Uh, the ISS tracks are definitely the ones who are focusing a bit more on what we call problem situating. So I would like to say a few words about this. Um, if within the remits of problem solving, uh, the focus so much is on the policy process uh, itself and the policy interventions to solve certain wicked problems in society, the problem situating approaches actually look precisely into these policy interventions and try to actually look at look at the lens the prism, or actually even at some point, the mirror through which political dynamics in society actually happen. So in that sense, it's a bit uh, the other way around. So in uh, to, to use other words, it becomes like the policy interventions are not necessarily then just solutions or, or as a particular kind of notions for policy recommendations, but they are in themselves the site for struggle, for political maneuvers, for political compromises. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. There are two implications that emanate out of those problem situating approaches. One, let me summarize at least two actually. Uh, one thematic, which, you, as you may uh, appreciate, uh, sometimes certain policy recommendations can be, uh, you know, a kind of a, how shall I say, an, an enhancement for change and a solution for particular problems. But one of the things that problem situating actually focuses on is how conditional these kind of things are and how specific. So if this is the case, they cannot be easily generalizable in that sense. But also problem situating invite us as well to focus more also on policy failures, not just on successes. And uh, the studies of these failures tell us a lot about those particular contexts. Problem situating also in, in, in encourages to look into the manner in which, in that sense, sometimes certain technical solutions are indeed available, but actually the players that are relevant may indeed decide not to use them. So hence, students of problem situating might be more interested to figure out the reasons, the how and the why's such kind of aspects happen or do not happen, etc. The second implication is a bit more abstract, but it's very complementary to this, to the number of interventions that I've made. So for example, the, in, in other words, problem situating encourages to understand and analyze the making of the contexts through which those uh, uh, policy interventions are happening. They also invite us to look into the conduct 
of the players that are interacting with those contexts. It invites us to look into, to study into the systems of meanings that are created in order to analyze these phenomena. Also the material circumstances that are interacting with those structures of meanings that are very, very important in explaining how those policy interventions are uh, actually occurring in society. We invite uh, also our cohorts to think about how ideas can make a difference, where do they come from, but also how we look into the not only the articulation of interests, but also the making of those interests and how they are exchanged with ideas. And as you can see, all of this is always situated within different temporalities, so an acute understanding of time, but also for the differentiation of geographical scales that are Im imbued within the whole thing. So in a nutshell, that's what problem situating approaches uh, um, talk about. I would like to give the floor uh, more uh, for the cohort to, to actually, if, if they would like to comment on some of those uh, particular issues, but in, in a nutshell, I'm more than happy to, uh, to answer further questions if, if there's a need for that, but I would like to also give the floor for uh, uh, other presentations in relation <laughs> to this as well. Well, uh, hi everyone. Uh, to, I want to say that for me, this seminar when I was uh, looking for my master was really helpful because I, I could see beyond like the what it was said in the in the page. So one one thing that I think it's really important, like to to tell you, is like um, this uh, problem situating. Honestly, at least to put it in easy words, <laughs> I would say that it gives you not, like an X ray x-ray to see what is beyond like the top of an, the iceberg that are the problem solving right like there are like <laughs> way more things and i think something really funny that happens that you can say is that we now speak in another kind of language in carrying language or problem uh, situating language and i think that's really wire our head in in another way for dealing with this uh, with these problems, uh, I would like to add that for me, problem situating it's more than an academical tool; is as well a tool for everyday problems. And you can see this as well. For example, um, we'll talk about it later in the practical components when it comes to the study visit and in the internships. Mm -hmm. We move that problem situating outside from the university and we bring it into everyday ideas. So. At least for me, I have changed in the way I solve my own problems. Because now <laughs> I, I I ask why, how, why this and why not this. So I found that, that really useful, not only to the academical research, but as well to the practical components. Uh, like, for example, in the internship, it was really insightful to see how we can actually came to think about why this solution and why not this other one, why people are prioritizing um, certain ideas, certain beliefs, other than others, but everything has a validity or everything can be applied to solve a problem, but then how I situate that problem, what's the root on the problem per se. Thank you, Alonso. Yeah, um, they've said a lot of what I, <laughs> what I was thinking of. I think what I could add is if you, in looking from a very much a poli public policy level, when you're looking at a document, you're most of the time just looking at words or it's most of the time someone has done some sort of research, but it's also very limited. So problem situating really makes you Think beyond what's on that piece of paper. Think beyond uh, and think through who was writing it, for example. Um, what were their motivations uh, of, of writing it this way? Why are certain things framed in a certain way? So really trying to go as deep as possible to understand what the problem is, because a lot of times you rush through, in, especially for policy making, you rush through trying to find solutions. But do those solutions actually fit? what the problem actually is. Do we really understand what the problem is? And problem situating gives you that tool um, to really broaden the scope, or not the scope, but broaden how you think. And it doesn't give you, and it's not supposed to give you a black and white, right or wrong answer. It's more of con the continuous questioning that you need to do to get to a point where you can say, this might be where I can stop for now to then uh, take the next step. And I think that's what problem situating has done for me. Um, Thank you, Natasha. Uh, actually, to also further to add some comments in relation to all of those valuable interventions, I would like to say maybe let, let me simplify it a bit. So if anyone is interested in the ISS tracks, if what you have in mind uh, is more like a public administration, uh, public management, this is not the track for you. But if you're more interested in 
you know, political economy approaches to public policy, to how we understand institutions, their making, their interaction with society, uh, and how, if you see value in how we, we can also um, invest a bit more in the uh, in the thinking tools that we have in order to actually deliver on uh, practical and, uh, and and everyday uh, concerns when it comes to public policy, then this is definitely the track for you. And I think this is a very important message that uh, I would like to uh, send here. That's one. Two, uh, when we say that the ISS tracks, they ha that is the identity, right? The identity is on problem situating, as I, we were trying to highlight. But that does not mean that there are no uh, other aspects of problem solving that the program has. It, it simply means that the identity, what the, the program expects is actually to speak uh, or to articulate, to be more precise, those particular skills. But that does not necessarily mean that uh, uh, there are no problem solving courses or problem solving encounters within the program. And this is why I would like to refer to you to the slide that I think you have in front of you, uh, just to, uh, to, to give you a, a, a quick idea about the structure of our program. As you can see, uh, actually, we distinguish between three particular components, the coursework, the practical component, and a research component. So in that sense, uh, through these, I might want to explain how problem situating is, a, if you want, the major identity, but also it is open enough for a variety of interests, as long as this identity is clear for everyone. So within the core courses, uh, we take uh, some courses that are similar between year one and year two, uh, and also be between year one in itself, meaning for those who also follow the program, but attended in Vienna within the Central European University. So all students who are enrolled in this program at the beginning, they would need to take courses on comparative public policy, which actually in a very simple way, deals with the nitty gritty kind of problem solving approaches that you may encounter within the field, but also you take some courses on economics of, of public policy as well. So it doesn't matter whether you are in Vienna or in The Hague, uh, these are courses that students would need to, uh, would need to focus on. Uh, in our track specific courses, and perhaps here, I can move to the slide after that, uh, we have a variety of courses that speak to, if you want, the identity of what is uh, being covered uh, at ISS, but also at year two institutions. Uh, so um, there is a course at ISS that focuses a lot on thinking about governance and institutions. This is the this is the course where the in introduction to problem situating skills uh, become key. Uh, that's the beginning of how. Uh, you know, the cohort is being trained to, to ask those particular questions, but also to be involved with a variety of debates and skills that, that attain these particular objectives. The course on contemporary capitalism and governance build on that and actually further depend, uh, deepen, sorry, uh, those problem situating skills. In the course of on politi politics of global development, the cohort have the opportunity to actually engage a bit more with the thematic debates about that. But later on in the course, they, when they are um, writing their uh, their essays, they would still have to uh, focus more on the ontological situating that they have learned throughout the whole year. So as you can see, the core courses at ISS, uh, they are they're marked in different terms, but they have, um, they're building on each other and there's a kind of a systemic link between them as well. But uh, the focus in our program is not only on core courses. Uh, so as you can see, uh, I just um, uh, took you through very quickly, of course, via the core courses and track specific courses. We do also have, uh, we offer some elective courses and of course uh, courses revolving around research techniques. But it's not just about uh, courses, we take pride that there's a practical component to our program. And uh, practically this uh, compromises of two particular activities. There is a democratically chosen student-led study visit and study trip that where every year the cohort decide where to go there are certain types of typologies of institutions that we would be interested to visit, which obviously speak to the demands of a public policy program. But it's a very student-led and student-friendly kind of trip, but it has a lot of a practical component and where uh, student cohort uh, have the opportunity to meet with practitioners in the field, really, and interact with them. And actually, two weeks after we come back, uh, many uh, have to write either a policy brief or a or an essay tackling some of the problems that those practitioners are dealing with. Also, what is mandatory for us is that everyone has to undertake an internship. We're also quite uh, proud that the internship for us can encompass a variety of aspects. So it, it speaks to those, for example, who may want to, you know, want to use it as a stage 
to get a you know a job in the future. So, for example, it will allow them to have an internship doing you know some important uh, transferable skills. Let's say for the next uh, stage in life. But other for other needs are different. So, for example, other students have had, per, 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 for example, a good um, or a longer. Uh, work experience, so they might want to also actually deal with some research internship or academic internship. We can also allow for this as well. So as I hope you see from my uh, little explanation, it encompasses a variety of activities uh, here. And we have also a rigorous research component. In year one, the cohort needs to produce what we call a thesis report. It's a 6,000 document where the beginning of the project is early defined. Uh, or the building blocks, the necessary building blocks are properly defined. And then this is further cemented uh, in the second year because our program is a, uh, of a joint nature. So where actually uh, students would have uh, supervisors from year one and year two, they won't change, the, the topic won't change, but the expectations of the thesis, they were, there would be other uh, layers that are you know, uh, being uh, put on top of the building blocks that are done on year one. The thesis report carries uh, something around the 10 uh, credits. And then in the thesis itself, it carries around 20 credits. So as you can see, it's quite important for us. In total, it, it carries 30 credits, which is something that we are quite uh, proud of uh, in, in, in the delivery of our program. So um, uh, I, I just wanted with this to give you a very very uh, short uh, description within the program. I wonder if um, any of you would like to add on some of those details I, I added or whether Darren, uh, we would like to open it for Q&A. Um, uh, maybe the students would like to add something about the practical components, like the study trips, the internship, especially the internship, because uh, the practicalities of the internship, that means like, you know, how do you find it? Uh, do you search it yourself? You know, uh, do you get any help or things like that? Maybe some one of the students can explain that. Just a few things about the study visit I think will be interesting to share. Um, like Karim mentioned, it is something that not just the cohort in uh, The Hague in ISS uh, choose, but also we do it jointly with our cohort uh, in the CEU, in the Central Uni European University in Vienna. So we would be communicating with each other through our student representatives uh, to decide on a list of places and then we'd vote on where to go. And I think you can see where I'm going with this. Then we will then be able to meet uh, our uh, cohort from CEU in the country that we're visiting. So that would be the first, I think one of the first challenges we have to uh, intermingle with uh, the other cohort. Um, and also, as you know, we are going to two different universities next year. I'm, I'm going to York and my and Fabiola and Alonso are going to Barcelona. So it will also be a chance for us to meet our other peers who are going to these universities and to be able to build relationships uh, with them, which is good because we're also going to completely different countries, uh, completely new environments. It'll be nice to have people that you already know. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share that about the study visit. That's nice. Thank you. Yeah, I'll add uh, quickly on the internship. It depends on whether you're interested in a more academical internship or like a more institutionalized internship. You can go on the goes on their NGOs, uh, international organizations. If you have any preference or so, uh, talking with Karim, which is uh, quite important, but <laughs> you have a lot of opportunities. Um, there's a, the ISS actually has a, a scholars committee that works around internship opportunities mm -hmm. in The Hague and even for alumni uh, work opportunities. The internship is a great opportunity to put in practice all the what we're learning from the core elective mm -hmm. courses. And um, it's one month internship, but I think it's a really high value experience if you want to build on you know, your professional career, especially if you don't have a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. It's a great opportunity to put in practice what you're learning in the course, uh, to meet other people, um, to get more uh, into a professional environment. And mm -hmm. it's most of the time done during uh, summer before um at the at least in ISS before we move on to the second year. But as well in ISS you can reach out to Kareem or um this call us come to, to get more internship opportunities, but as well you can search around your own and just make sure you have the the approval from ISS um, to start it. Yeah, I think that we are in The Hague, so there are a lot of international organizations that you can apply to and being here like it's it, it's really nice i think yeah. it gives you a lot of chances there are also like a work class where you can apply 
And uh, no, yeah, from for the um, a study visit also something that was really interesting we choose like uh, different kind of institutions and it was really interesting to see how there are different approaches with all these lenses with these x-rays that i was telling you about uh, work like in practice that was really nice and the fact that we can choose like completely tailor-made nothing is like imposed that's mm -hmm. something also really valuable like depending on your interest you will be able to choose uh, what kind of internship what do you want to learn in terms of practically things that you cannot see in the classroom that it's totally important and I I really like that mm -hmm. yeah. thank you uh, everyone um uh, I have a question about um when would be the best time to conduct your internship? And do you receive help to find an internship? Other than the scholars, Alonso, you mentioned earlier, uh, do you get any other help uh, outside scholars? So first, uh, the first question is maybe, when is the best time to do your internship? I would I would recommend um, to start it like in the first term at ISS because the academical load is not really huge mm -hmm. and it gives you a lot of time to handle it correctly because you are adapting yourself in the Hague might be a bit tough because you're moving recently but um during November December is a good time because onwards the workload gets a bit more heavy you have a lot of the other stuff going around you got your thesis component so especially to start it before even you have to start with your thesis it's ideal uh when it comes to finding the internship I find it on my own on impact tools and then uh, my process went to that, so showing Graham the offer, getting the approval, and now I'm working onwards my report on the thesis. But I also want to say, of course, every every person would have their their own needs sometimes and their own circumstances. Uh, but I totally agree the 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 ideal period would be the the first semester mm -hmm. because the load would be lower. But but taking into condition that it can also work differently for, mm -hmm. for different circumstances. And I just want to also add that at the beginning of the year, ISS, we, we would send a list and a very updated list of the all the organizations that previous Mundus MAP students at ISS have done their internship with. So it also gives them an idea about previous organizations that we have welcomed uh i ISS and mundus map students before we've also uh very recently we've made some agreements with some institutions we call uh associate partners now this is the language that we use and part of our deals now with them is that they may give us on an on a yearly basis you know some already some places for our interns as well so that might ease a bit some of the pressures that we're talking about yeah that's it thank you karim and uh, everyone uh Another question I have is maybe you can explain a little bit um, what happens in the day uh, in a Mundus MAP class. I mean, I know you have assignments, you have a lot of readings and things like that. Maybe you can explain uh, from the student point of view so that the other students who are going to come in September have a general idea of what to expect uh, during the Mundus MAP class or classes, let's say. I think students are best to explain this. Uh, you will find that at least uh, different from um, from the CEU, they have they told us that they have a lot of classes. We have some uh, like we have a less number of courses, but that doesn't mean <laughs> that the the work is is less. Um, so obviously, you will have to read a, a lot. Like that, that's a fact. <laughs> Um, and maybe have uh, one or two courses uh, by day, but you will have enough time, like for for doing all the work that that these courses uh, are demanding from you. So, yeah, a lot of reading, course of, of two a day. But mm -hmm. anything, I would just add that um, the like Karim mentioned, the core courses uh, they build up on one from one to another, so it does get more intensive and uh, more mm -hmm. challenging. But like like Fabiola said, like if you do the if you do the readings and you're engaged in class, you do get to slowly build yourself to that level. But also remember that we have elective, we can take elective courses as well, mm -hmm. um, which could be more towards uh, geared towards uh, areas, thematic areas that we're interested in. 
uh, or areas that we've never had a chance to, to, to learn about. So you can balance the more intensive core coursework, um, that my, my pers personal opinion, the more intensive coursework with other electives. Um, so you can find some sort of balance between the different courses, the different intensity levels and different workloads, especially in terms of uh, readings that, we, that are uh, required uh, for different courses. And also you, not all the courses are built the same way, uh, of course. Mm. Uh, different courses have different types of assignments. Uh, so again, for the elective courses, that's also something to look at. If you're someone who wants to have more interactive assignments, then that's also something you can pick from your elective courses. So again, just how do you work on balancing uh, your terms? Uh, term one, term we have three terms in the first year, for example. And as, as Fabi mentioned, we might have one or two classes per day. Um, three or three times or four times a week. Um, the classes are around an hour, 45 minutes with mm -hmm. a break in the middle. So, you know, you get perhaps 45 minutes and then 10 minute break and then 45 minutes. So they're broken, they're managed in that way. Um, but I would highly suggest that when you look at, uh, look, don't just look at the core courses as on their own, look at the core courses with the elective courses uh, mm -hmm. that you are interested in. So you can then see how they weave into each other and how you can balance uh, expectations from those different courses. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Natasha and uh, Fabiola. A general question, um, how did you find moving to The Hague and how social, li uh, social life as a group of Mundus Mab students, do you also integrate with the uh, the MA and Development Studies students as well? Well, moving to the Hague was nice because of the time that you arrive, uh, August, September, weather is really nice. Um, you can have a lot of terrors and because it's the first week, you actually hang around with people from other MA. So essentially the first two, three weeks, you are with people from other MAs and you share with them even core courses on the second on the third and se second and third term from the first even and even from the first like you always have classes with them you see them all around in the in university um, we're even our neighbors with them uh, when you run the dual facility so mm -hmm. the social life is really good and as i would say as a mundus map group we hang a lot actually even yeah. for studying <laughs> we like our social activities are just studying uh, going for a coffee going uh <laughs> to the beach so there's a lot of uh social balance and even sometimes when we're just like having a drink or coffee we even bring up um conversation from classes oh, yes. to talk about like everyday topics uh <laughs> that, that thinking in, uh, yes we talk about ontology quite a bit yeah. <laughs> yeah we talk about ontology in institutions yeah. <laughs> yeah that's why that's <laughs> what i was mentioning when you will have another language <laughs> and you will use it in your day to like day life but yeah. that is really cool like oh, that's really cool seeing that transformation and yeah your your colleagues here will tell you like oh you're you're talking about ontology again. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you must be mundus yes 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 yeah. Really. Yeah, but, and it is right that. And yeah. just to add to that, there's also different um, student-led committees. So they, when you first come to The Hague, um, they have different uh, events. They would actually organize different events. So you will get invitations to the different events. Um, there's also you know, um, a chat group that you can join just to connect with people. And um, yeah, it, there isn't really a separation no. between us as a Mundus program and the, uh, the Masters for, uh, in Development Studies, really. Uh, ISS is the building that we're in right now. Actually, we're sitting on the ground floor um, and you will have seen people walking around. So it's it's a pretty relaxed space. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it was good. I mean, it, yeah. it didn't feel that you were, you know, that you, you knew that you were away from home, but you could build a community yeah, when yeah. you get here. Yeah, that's for sure. It's going to be hard to leave it, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, just to add, and on top of that, every Sundays you have sports day, yes. right? So uh, that's also important. It's not all about just studying, but you also need to do uh, be healthy, let's say, uh, to uh, let it out. So you can, we, I says we book a sports hall uh, uh, from five to nine, is it? Five, five to seven. seven. Five to seven, sorry. Seven. But that starts uh, so, uh, football. football. Uh, yeah. Okay, 
So you can uh, also participate in that uh, sports and things like that. Okay. Yeah, we're currently thinking. We're yeah. currently thinking about a, a problem situating approach to sport. No, I'm just. Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of our colleagues, yes, is doing <laughs> in, in in sport. <laughs> <laughs> you can. So it's actually, yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> There's no limit. What we can we do. have uh, no more questions from the audience, but I have one last question for Karim. Um, and maybe also the students can participate in this. Um, possible career trajectory after graduation. Um, maybe Karim, you can explain a little bit and then maybe the students can say what they would like to do after they graduate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, very good question. Quite a variety, to be honest. Um, from my experience, I mean, I've been involved with this program from the beginning, so it's like more than 16, 17 years now. Um, I would say um, I mean, there are a variety of career pathways, but the major three that I always see uh some go back to government jobs uh i have to say we, we were um we, we were ma we managed to get a variety of um accreditations and sometimes we had to you know uh, do some surveys we were quite proud that uh, at some point we had to interview some of uh you know those organizations that have also welcomed our alumni right and uh, we we're very happy that a lot of them commented we've noticed that we have we've been very impressed with the analytical skills that they bring back to the job and the manner in which they uh, they've entered this uh, this field. And I'm talking here about a whole array of uh, you know ministries or anything related to formal institutions in that sense. But it doesn't stop there. There's a lot that also go into international organizations, UN, um, even World Bank, what have you. Many other uh, inter the inter-American uh, organization as well. So we've had lots of alumni uh, that oriented themselves towards these organizations. And I have to say, uh, of course, a variety of NGOs and policy uh, think tanks, and but a, an important part, uh, PhDs. We're quite actually proud. That a lot of our students are capable and amenable to apply to a lot of PhD positions after they finish this master's program. And that is a, a serious track that we are seeing as well through the parcours of our uh, graduates and alumni. I hope I I answered the question in that sense. I wonder mm -hmm. if yeah. you want to talk about your expectations or um, I don't know. Right now it's really confusing, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> just sure. look into the future. But I I can say I got here with the intention of getting back to um to international organizations. Uh, I, I had a good experience working there. So I am hoping that now that I have this X-ray, <laughs> it's going to be even easier to get there. <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> yeah, for mine as well, uh, my professional would be to go into an international organization because I have peer experience was on one. So it's really insightful, mm -hmm. at least in short term. Yeah. Um, so my experience has been in non-governmental organizations, uh, working in the development sector, and I've been, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and I definitely would like to go uh, to work within that same similar space, uh, definitely more on the policy side to really be part of those corridors um, and see how <laughs> and see how actual change uh, can be made. Yeah, as you can see, a variety of pathways yeah. uh, in relation to that. Well, thank you so much, guys. Um, I think we can end the webinar. There's no, no more questions. So um, to all the viewers, uh, if you have any questions uh, after watching the webinar, uh, you can send me an email, study at iss.nl. And if you would like to talk to the students or the course dealer, Karim, uh, you can also send me the, the questions first and then uh, I can pass it on to them. Um, so uh, thanks again for coming and um, we hope to see you here in September. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.